little session um, with some theory in it, but it's, it, it's going to be focusing on activities that we can use in a language class and hopefully um, there are activities that are suitable for a range of different languages. Um, I want to start off with a game, actually. And um, if you don't like games, then I'd like to start off with a language activation activity, which is the same thing, but um, sometimes people prefer to use that name. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you has everyone got a pen? Everyone needs a pen and a piece of paper. Is that a tool? Is that a... No, is that, is that difficult? Has everyone got a pen and a piece of paper? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to um, flash a sentence to you on the whiteboard. And um, the words in it are jumbled up. And I'd like you to try to just look at, you're going to look at it very quickly and just try and write the words in the order in which you think they should be. Okay? But you're going to have, you're going to really only have a few seconds to do it. Okay? Everyone ready? Yeah? Okay. So I think there are four, there are four of them. Okay? So we'll just go through them one at a time. Coming in a minute. Okay, so that's the first one. Here's the next one. Okay, here's the next one. Here's the last one. Okay, if you're not, I mean, just, just have a guess. I mean, some of them, you probably noticed that some of them were a lot easier than others. Um, just, just kind of hazard a guess if you're unsure. Okay, we are gonna, we're going to go through those then now. So, uh, the first one, any ideas what the first one is? What can I get you? Yeah. And the second one? The new friend's got drunk? Yeah. Oops. No. Okay. Well, it, it, it could have been the new friends got drunk, but it, but I, the sentence that I originally wrote was the drunk got new friends. Okay. Now, um, okay. So everyone got the first, everyone immediately probably picked up on the first one that it was what can I get you. Um, the second one probably there was a bit more thinking that was going on. Um, you, you perhaps didn't know straight away, but probably what was in your head was um, the uh, got drunk collocation. Yes. Yeah? Um, you know, that was, so immediately you quickly saw that strong collocation and you, you, it registered somewhere in your brain. Yeah? Okay. We'll have a, I mean, of course, um, the, the new friends got drunk may be a more likely sentence than the drunk got new friends. It may be a more likely sentence. <coughs> but um, this sentence is also possible. Yeah? It's also possible. It's something that, that can happen. And I have experienced it. So <laughs> I, I, can, I can guarantee you that it is something that can happen. Okay, I'm going to show you... We'll go through the, the last, the next ones. So, what about that one? Look at it from my point of view. Yeah. And the next one. 
The heavy smoker thought the traffic resembled jam. Is that possible? Yeah. The heavy smoker thought the traffic resembled jam. Yeah, that's possible. Any other? The heavy Uh -huh. oh, okay. Right, okay. Okay, now, so it's interesting that you have naturally gone for collocations. You've naturally picked up on those collocations. So in that, in that string of words, there are several collocations, aren't there? There's, um, you know, heavy traffic, there is um, traffic jam, and heavy smoker. Okay, so our brain is naturally quickly finding those collocations. Um, in fact, the sentence that I wrote originally was the smoker thought the traffic resembled heavy jam. Okay, so it's an extremely unlikely sentence, um, but it is a grammatically possible sentence. There's no reason grammatically why that sentence shouldn't exist. Um, it, it may exist somewhere in some um, surreal poem or, or something. There may be a context <coughs> in which that sentence could exist. But our brain is unlikely to, to find it because it, it's, not a, it's not a usual sentence. Um, of course, um, you know, we, may want to want, we may wonder what the smoker was smoking if he thought that the traffic did resemble heavy jam. So, the, the, but then the point is there may be a context in which that sentence could exist. Um, why are we doing this? Why, why, um, why are the second sentences from each pair much easier than the first ones? Because we are, our brain is naturally storing language as chunks. We're not just storing language as individual items, we're storing it as chunks of language, as formulaic language. Um, it's interesting that these sentences are disorganized in exactly the same way. If you see what I mean. So the second word, so we've got look, the first word is the same in both. Then we've got the, where is it? It is the third word. And it's the same with this sentence. We've got the third word. Do you see what I mean? So they're disorganized in exactly the same way. So, so there shouldn't be any reason, so that shouldn't be a factor in, in, in reorganizing them. Um, so recently, um, materials that have been published in uh, language teaching materials have, have used this fact a lot more. They've tended to focus a lot more on chunks of language rather than on individual words. They've focused on formulaic language um, and you know so for instance Michael Lewis who wrote the lexical approach and later implementing the lexical approach says uh, modern anal analyses of real data suggest that we are much less original in using language than we like to believe. Much of what we say and a significant proportion of what we write consists of prefabricated multi-word items. In other words, we are uh, churning out language as unanalyzed and prefabricated lumps. And we haven't necessarily analyzed that language. We haven't necessarily, so for instance, if we're working um, you know, a beginner learner of English, for instance, will learn a chunk like how are you? Or, or maybe even something like where have you been? Without analysing the, gr the grammar behind that. And without even necessarily breaking it down into words. Um, you know, more recently... Um, Alison Ray from the University of Cardiff published Formulaic Language Pushing the Boundaries and she's come up with this, this idea of an MEU, a Morphine Equivalent Unit. So a Morphine Equivalent Unit is 
something that we store in our brain as an unanalyzed item. So we don't break down something like, um, uh, let's think of a good example. Um, well, let's say, let's say something like, where have you been? Where have you been? We, we, we take that as one item. That's, that's stored in our brain as one item. We're not thinking uh, where plus have plus you plus be. We're storing it as a, as a single item. Now, if I think about my own experiences um, as a language learner, this, um, you know, this certainly rings true. Um, the first language that I was challenged to learn um, and to use was, was Danish. I mean, I, obviously, I, I studied languages at school before that. But through living in Denmark and having to use the language on a daily basis, um, I was challenged to sort of really get my head around the language. And I found that I was often picking up chunks of language and not analysing them. Um, an, ex an extreme example of that. Are there any Danish speakers in here? No? Okay, that's good. So I can, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, an extreme example of that might be the Danish uh, phrase um, Diviasquik. Diviasquik. Um, now, Davia Squick means, um, I don't bloody know. That's what it means. Um, but I, I didn't realise the full power of that utterance when I learnt it. I heard people using it around me. I was working on a farm in Denmark, and the farmer that I worked for, he used, these, he used that a lot. Perhaps it's not quite as strong as I don't bloody know, but it's sort of... It, it's getting there. It, it has a slightly taboo element to it. Um, and I just heard him using that all the time, and I picked it up, and I started using it myself. But I didn't realise it, that it meant that. I just thought it meant it was just another way of saying, I don't know. So there was an example of an unanalyzed chunk of language that I, in fact, was able to use. I was actually able to communicate with that, perhaps somewhat unsuccessfully, but I did... I, I still, I mean, the process happened to me. I took on that piece of language. Now, um, I think this has, you know, I think this does have some implications for, for what we do in the classroom. Um, one thing that this does bring up is memory, the whole idea of memory. I mean, for a long time we focused on encouraging learners to learn the meanings of words. And of course that is a massive task for particularly beginners in a new language to, to learn the meanings of new words. But not only do they have to do that, they also have to learn the patterns, the common patterns in which those words occur. I mean, if we take an example like, um, we take a word like exam, now, in, in many European languages, um, exam will be a very similar word. So we can, um, you know, our, our learners can sort of have a kind of false sense of security of thinking, oh, I know, what that, that I know that word, because it's the same, it's a very similar word. But in fact, if we want our learners, if we want our learners to use that word successfully, we need to know the patterns, the common uh, ways in which that word is used. So which verbs collocate with exam, for instance. And I've got myself into lots of trouble, well not into lots of trouble, but I've made lots of errors through, um, through mis-collocating, through using the wrong, wrong verb in other languages. I mean, so in English we might have things like pass an exam, take an exam, um, sit an exam, uh, scrape through an exam, possibly. You know, there's all those those ideas. Those words are not necessarily the words that you would use in in another language. Those verbs may be very different. Um, so in Spanish, for instance, what what would be the word in Spanish? Do an exam. Do an exam. We would would you take an exam? No. No. So you know, the, and I, if we if I look at the the learners, my learners of English, often the mistakes that they make are. Uh, to do with collocation. 
so um, we've got a huge, there's a huge load on the memory. Um, now, this session is called the creative memory. Um, and so one side of that is that we are, we are less creative, as Michael Lewis says, we are less creative than perhaps was previously thought. We're not constantly creating new language. We're relying on a stock of phrases that we have somewhere that we've heard before and that we've acquired. However, as language teachers, creativity is, well, I would say that creativity is what keeps me going as a language teacher. I would say that it's, it's, the, it's, it's almost an essential element of teaching. And I would also say it's an essential element of learning a language. Um, and I think there are lots of techniques and activities that we can do with our students which link creativity with memorization. Um, one very well-known activity, um, which has been around for a very long time, is the keyword memory technique. So the keyword memory technique um, allows me to remember lots of words in different languages. So I know that, for instance, in Polish, <coughs> the word for a screwdriver is trubokrem. Yeah? And I know that in Spanish, the word for blinds is persianas. And I know that in, Itali in Italian, the word for screwdriver is cacciavite. Um, and I know that in Hebrew, the word for good night is laila tov. Okay? And all of those words are stored, or I've, I've learnt all of those words, through this keyword memory technique. Now, I'm not just doing that to sort of show off, because I don't know any other words in those languages. <laughs> uh, well, some of them I don't. But um, it, is a, it is a method which, which um, is very creative and which also has quite a lasting power. Um, I'll just show you some examples of how that might work. So, the Polish word for screwdriver is trubokrem. And the way that I'm remembering that word is I'm linking it to three English words, shrew, hook, and round. Now it sounds, it has a quite a similar sound to those words, although it's not very, it's not, the word is not shrew, book, round, it's shrew, or I don't know if that's completely perfect, but... Um, you know, the, the pronunciation is not exactly the same as, as the English words, but these act as a trigger to remember it. So what I'm doing in my head is I'm creating an image which links screwdriver with these key words. So what I've got in my head is an image of a shrew um, coming to my house, knocking on my door and saying, um, I've brought your book round. You know, the, the book I borrowed from you, I brought it round. Here it is. And I get very angry with the shrew, and I hit it with a screwdriver. Okay? Now, it's quite an obscure, it's quite an obscure image, um, but it is um, a very lasting image, and it's something that I created myself, and therefore probably more memorable. Let's just look at a few other examples. Katia Vite, uh, Italian word for screwdriver, the way that I remember that is through the words catch and vito, as in vito coleone. So I have an image in my head of me chasing vito coleone. I'm trying to catch vito coleone and I've got a screwdriver. I'm chasing after him. Vito coleone in the Godfather. The, um, it was Marlon Brando, wasn't it? Marlon Brando was the vito coleone character. Okay. So we'll do another word, a couple of those. Persianas is the word for blind. I hope it is, isn't it? Isn't it? it is. It is. Yeah. Um, so persianas, I remember that because of the English word. I've linked it to the word Persian. And I have this image in my head of a Persian 
man in history, a sort of historical Persian man who is blind. So he's blind, and he's, I've got this image of a blind Persian man, and that's linking it to the word. Okay? A couple more examples. Laila Tov in Hebrew means good night. So it's quite an obvious image there. Somebody's lying down and somebody says, oh, light's off now. Good night. Turn the light <coughs> off. Good night. Yeah? Now, um, now this one I'm, I'm unsure about. But I've never tried to learn this word. Um, do we have any Nepali speakers in here? Or, no, we don't. Do uh, but I learned this word through <coughs> observing a Nepali class here at SOAS. And this word, Bhagyamani, I think it, I'm not sure exactly what the pronunciation is, something like that. Bhagyamani means lucky in Nepali. So the teacher drew the student's attention to this fact and said, oh look, bag of money, it sounds like bag of money. You're very lucky if you have a bag of money, if you find a bag of money, yeah? Now, I didn't actively try and remember that, but it stuck in my head. It, stuck, it just stuck in my head completely. I mean, what didn't, what, what I'm not sure about, because I didn't have any, I didn't do any repetition of it, I, um, I, I didn't try to, pronounce the word, I'm really unsure as to the pronunciation, and in fact I only found that by looking it up on the internet, how, how it would be written using the Roman script. Um, but, I mean, it, it is quite a powerful technique. Um, I mean, maybe we'll just quickly, could, could somebody just give me a word um, in a language that I don't know, and we'll see if, it, if we can, how, see if we can create a, an image for it. Could I have a, just somebody, uh, uh, yeah? Anthar Rashtriya. Anthar Rashtriya, international. Anthar Rashtriya. Rashtriya. Yeah. Anthar Rashtriya. Anthar, Anthar Rashtriya. What language is that? Hindi. Hindi. Anthar Rashtriya. Okay, so what, what kind of words might we link that to? Anthar Rashtriya. And Russia? Sure, yeah. Yeah? Ashtray. <laughs> Ashtray. Enter Ashtray. Ashtray, yeah, yeah, yeah. Enter, you said enter Russia. Russia, yeah. Enter Rashtria. I'm also. Okay, so I mean, for instance. <coughs> we might have, you know, uh, we've got the international tree of the world, yeah, there's this tree, it's an international tree, <coughs> and each branch represents different places, and then um, a new branch grows, and it's Russia, enter Russia, enter Rashtria, enter Rashtria, so we're using the the, the linking words enter Russia and tree. Okay, okay. Now, um, sometimes when I focus on this activity <coughs> with teachers or with students, people say, oh God, it's so, it's so much work. Yeah, it's a lot of thinking, a lot of, um, I think in my experience of working with advanced learners, I found that lots of advanced learners of English use this strategy. And um, it, I think what happens is you start to do it naturally and very quickly after, you know, after it's been introduced. Um, and I think it works particularly well for um, people who are native speakers of English I don't know, no, I don't know, I don't know. That's just my experience. I don't know why that might possibly be. But um, sometimes other people have said, oh, my, uh, it's difficult to find those sounds in other languages. I don't know. Um, could we try it with a couple of words in Danish? So I'm going to just tell you a couple of words in Danish. Just see if you can create some link to...
to store those words in your memory. Okay? So the words in Danish are uh, trousers in Danish is buksa. 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 Yeah? That's trousers. Buksa. Okay? And I'll give you another one. And the other one is um, investigation in Danish is onasunsa. 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 Investigation. Is it really 10 to 6? Oh, I just looked at my watch. Yes, yeah. Right, okay. Uh, could you just quickly have a chat with the person next to you and just see if, just see what kind of strategies you might use to, remember, to link those words? Okay, look, um, sorry, we're, I didn't quite realise we were so short of time. Um, just, can we just hear maybe a couple of strategies? Anyone got a good strategy for our books, sir? The sound. Right, okay, yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, you've got your boxes underneath your trousers, yeah. yeah. Okay, how about one suit? Yeah. <coughs> how did you do that? Investigation, just some. Investigation. So you're thinking about just the syllable, the syllable count is very similar. Sure. Suicide. Unsuicide. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Suicide. Okay. If we say on a suicide, implying that you know researching into a suicide, on a suicide, attempt on searching suicide, what's going on? What happened? Mm -hmm. On a suicide. Uh -huh. Sure. Okay. Great. On a suicide. Yeah. On a suicide. Honor, oh, honor, honor suicide, yeah, sure. It is to the Suez Canal. Okay. Rather than the denial, death on the Suez, so there's an investigation taking place on the Suez. Ah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, it'd be interesting to see, you know, if, if, how long those, those things last. Of course, we need to do other things as well with these words, but they're a good, I think this, they're a good way in to, to language. Um, and I think they, they, can, they can sort of build learner's confidence quite a lot. Um, look, I'm going to, just focus very quickly on a couple of activities, because um, we're a little bit short of time. Um, now, another memory technique which, which may be useful in the language classroom is the Loki memory technique, which, which was used a lot in, um, in ancient Greece. Well, with the earliest uses of it um, seem to be in ancient Greece. 
And for this, we're going to use this drawing on the board of, um, of a face. Um, so you can see you've got a list of, of items there. You've got 10, 10 items, which, let's say there's somebody who's come to London and they want to remember these things. Perhaps they've got to buy these things. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our face and our upper body um, as a way of linking these things. So we're going to try and remember them using that. So for instance, uh, number one, a SIM card for my mobile. We're going to link that to our right shoulder. Okay. So how could we link a SIM card for my mobile to my right shoulder? Any ideas? Posted. Yeah. It have to be worse, does it? What? You sure. Just, like you have a chip on your shoulder. You've got a chip <laughs> on your <laughs> shoulder. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you've got a chip. So you, you could use that expression. You've got a chip on your shoulder. I mean, you could have. You could. Um, you know. You could have, for instance, you've just got this, the SIM card. You've got this idea that there's a phone. Maybe the phone's on one. You're holding the phone on one shoulder, like that. You know, as you often do. Um, but the SIM card's somewhere else. You know, maybe the SIM card's on the other shoulder or, or something. So you can't quite get the SIM card in the phone. I mean, the more, the more surreal the image, the, the often the, the more powerful it is. Um, olive oil, for instance, how might we remember that? The number two. Lock, yes, Earwax, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I was a child, my mother was constantly pouring <laughs> gallons of um, olive oil into my ears. Um, so that's, that's quite a logical one there. Uh, number three, a new mouse for the computer. <coughs> okay, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, so just with the person next to you, could you just quickly just see if you can create an image which links those items to those parts of the body? So we've got one, two, three, four, five... Yeah. yeah. We'll just try with this first of all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Y
just that's something else. But just just see if you can remember what they are, the ones that you've done. Just see if you can remember. Just in your group, just going through them. Okay. See what you can remember of the things that you've done. So. think it's actually quite an interesting and, 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 and enjoyable activity for students to do to create these images and to discuss the images that they've created. Um, I mean how did you did you find that you could do that or were, yeah. was it reasonably successful? Yeah? Except for the Greek yogurt. The Greek yogurt. <laughs> uh -huh. The batteries, I always think the batteries is quite an interesting one if we have it for Nose. nose. I mean, there's an obvious sort of two thing of <laughs> sticking one up one nose and one up the other. Yeah. So, does anyone have any other interesting images? For... We thought uh, it was sort of charging the lungs, which is the motor of your body. I mean, you will die without oxygen. So. Uh -huh. Oh, so the, because the, yeah. <coughs> you breathe yeah. down to your lungs. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Great. Okay. Um, I mean, you can develop this. I've, I've kind of got to the stage, I can't remember them now, but I did have 50 items of different items that are stored in different parts of my body. Um, I mean, you can also use um, a, a place, you know, we could link them to um, a journey from our house to school or something like that. But um, I quite like the body thing because you've always got your body, you can't forget, your body's there, isn't it? So you, um, that, that's quite memorable for me. Okay, now, look, I want to just, Dennis, I want to do something very physical, um, just to finish. Whoops. An interesting book that I read recently um, is called Left in the Dark. And this book suggests that... Um, the, well, I'll read the quote to you first of all. The most functional and deepest part of our memory lies either within our right brain or is accessed by its function. Because of our less efficient left brain, because our less efficient left brain is dominant, we routinely experience difficulty accessing more than our superficial memory. So it's interesting that in this book the suggestion is made that although language um, is traditionally viewed as a, as a left brain activity um, actually memory uh, the memory for language we may be better off using our right brain and in some cases our left brain is actually stopping our right brain from functioning so this book argues very strongly for could have more traditional linking more traditional right brain activities <coughs> such as music, such as drama, such as movement um, with language in order to aid that memory process. So if I have, do I have a couple of minutes? Is that okay? Do I just carry on for a couple of minutes? So I'd just like to do something very physical first of all, uh, as a sort of final thing. Um, so if you could all just stand up please. So I'm going to read you a text and I would like you to act the text out altogether. 
as I read it out to you. So I'd like you to sort of do what I say, okay? And you can, so you can move around, you can do whatever you like, okay? So, um, I was walking in the forest. I saw a box on the ground in front of me. I picked it up. I slowly opened the lid. Ah! A bird flew out and hit me in the face. I looked inside. Wow! It was full of treasure. I filled up my pockets as quickly as I could. Oh no! Someone was coming. I turned around and ran for my life. <laughs> okay. All right, excellent. Now, if we're doing that with students, just have a seat again. If we're doing that with students, um, we might do that several times so that they're really familiar with the text. Um, and we might do it in a, a, you know, very quickly. We might do it as a speeded up activity. And then a nice thing to do is to, to do something like this. We could show them, we could show them the text. Um, each of these lines represents a letter in a word. Um, and we see if they, can, if they can recall the language using that. Um, this is more challenging. We haven't given any clues here. I mean, we could also... Well, just have a go at it. Is there anything... Can you remember... How the text began? I was walking in the forest. I, was in the forest. I saw a box on the ground in front of me. I picked it up. A bird flew out and hit me in the face. Oh no! Someone was coming. Okay, so it's the kind of thing. Um, that the students can do in small groups. And it's very nice having those, those spaces there because it really challenges the learners to think about accuracy and think about what, possible, what possibilities there could be. Um, I mean, we can make it slightly easier by doing this kind of thing and giving them the beginnings of words. I mean, there are various different ways we could do it. But here, obviously, it's much easier here. But we could also take away the, the number of letters each thing. But that's, a, that's an interesting activity because what, what happens with that activity is you're having to, to go back and you're having to remember your physical movements. Um, this, I mean, obviously we can vary it, we can make it much more difficult, we can make it simpler depending on the group that we have. Um, and this activity comes from well, not this, this version, but the original version that I found comes from this excellent book called Dictation, New Methods, New Possibilities, by Paul Davis and Mario Rimbalucri. Okay, well, um, I'm sorry that that um, was rather rushed there. I just suddenly had a... I suddenly looked at my watch and thought... 20 minutes... Uh, sorry, I've only got 10 minutes left. So, um, I think I'll, I will leave it there. So thank you very much for, for coming.